Come on, can we sing it? Come on. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Come on, church, let's sing it. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible.
bow down before your throne see your face I cry out because you're holy 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 are you Lord Jesus King of Kings Jesus Majesty, I can't wait. For 
for eternity Join the song they're already singing Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord Just to bow down before your throne See your face I cry out because you're holy you, God. Can we just take a second and not necessarily worship Him as Savior, but can we take a second and worship Him as Lord? It feels good. We know He saved us from our sins. Man, what a great, great, awesome thing that that is when we know that we are saved from an eternity of hell 
that we all deserve because of our sin nature and he saved us from that. But he's also our Lord. He also deserves our praise. You know, he's the only person that ever walked this earth and lived a perfect life being tempted just like we were, but never sinning. He is, that means he has earned the right to sit at the right hand of God and be worshiped as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that comes whether we feel like it or not, whether we feel like our circumstances are going the way we think they should go. He's still God, he's still King. He still lived a perfect life and is deserving of praise and honor and gratitude and glory and the very best that we can muster as human beings to say, Lord, we thank you for being our savior, but we wanna take a minute and just worship you as Lord. We wanna be in submission to you today. Come on, can you just lift your hands all over this room? Maybe right where you are watching online, just lift your hands to him. We worship you, Jesus. You're the king of all, above all kings. You're worthy of our praise. We take our hurts and we lay them before your feet. We take our shortcomings and we lay them before your feet, knowing that we couldn't do anything in and of ourselves to make ourselves worthy enough to come before you. But it's all because of Jesus. It's all because of his worthiness. It's all because of his willingness, his love for us. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you as Lord today. Can you just tell him that maybe in your own words? Maybe you even just wanna say it out loud or in your heart, he hears you. I worship you as Lord today. I worship you as my Lord, the authority over my life. I worship you as the one that I'm giving the authority to, decisions that I'm making. I'm not reserving for myself the right to make them, but I lay them at your feet. Come on, that's what it means to worship him as Lord. I, I, I am giving myself to you wholly because you're worthy of me. You're Lord. Oh, great God. Lord, you see us all over this room. You see us watching online and you know where we are. You know our circumstance. You know our state. You know the air of our lives and what we're walking in. And Lord, for a moment, we just throw all that off to the side. And we say, you're still worthy of praise. You're still worthy of it. Come on, am I talking to anybody who's walking through a season where there's more questions than answers, but you still wanna say, but you're still good. You're still worthy of praise. And I'm gonna bring it to you, even though it's like the word says, sometimes it's a sacrifice of praise, but you never stop being Lord. You never stop being the King of Kings. You never stop being Jesus. Jesus, the King of kings. Come on, we're gonna worship him in eternity. I love how the song says, we're not gonna wait for that to start, but we're gonna start singing the song of heaven right now. Right where we are, right in the middle of the pain, right in the middle of what it means to be human and have to trust in faith when you don't see it with your eyes yet, but we still believe, we still have a hope on the inside of us even though we don't see it fleshly. Come on, am I talking to anybody who needs to grab onto that today? Come on, be encouraged today. God's on the move doing something. You can't see it just yet, but he's honored and blessed when you begin to worship him in faith and in truth, knowing that he's Lord, he's God. He can't mess it up, he's incapable. He can't mess up. He can't go against his word. He can't go against his faithfulness. We worship you. Come on, that's the God we're worshiping today. He's Lord. He's King of Kings. Lord, can we just pray together? We, we trust you, God. We're submitting to you right now. And we're saying we worship you as Lord. And we love you that we're able to even do that. We're, there's no other being on the planet, the universe. There's no other person that we could come to like that. We read in your word where you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You're the God who, at, when this age is done for eternity, you'll be God, perfect in power, and we'll be with you. But Jesus, you said, I'm never gonna leave you nor forsake you. You understand that we're here right now, and you're with us. Your word says all the way to the end of this age. And that's what gives us hope. That's what gives us the encouragement in our spirit to say, it doesn't matter what we're walking through. We can still worship you as Lord. We believe it in faith and we honor you with our lives. So be honored, Lord, at what you see here today. And as we get ready to dig into your word, Lord, our prayer is that you change us any way you want. Come on, that's another way we worship him as Lord. We give you permission. 
Show us the places in our hearts that you want us to move and shift. Show us the places in our hearts that you want to make us better. We don't want to be stagnant. We don't want to, we don't want to call ourselves Christians, but then lack power in our lives. We're supposed to be a light to this world. That means we're supposed to do things differently. And as we begin to, to worship you and have a peace inside of us that comes to you, even before we see the answers, Lord, we ask that you change us. Do it any way you want to do it. Come on, if you agree with that, can we get a big amen? amen? Come on, look at somebody, say, Jesus is Lord. You can have a seat. Thank you guys for watching online. Maybe you just want to put that in the chat. Jesus is Lord. I'm so glad he's Lord. I don't have what it takes to be that, do you? In fact, the closer I get to him, the more I realize how much of an empty human being I am. And I need, I need him to fill me up. Uh, I'm so grateful for, for you being here today. Uh, I'm, I know that God's got an encouraging word for you today. Uh, I've already been encouraged by it earlier this week, uh, last week rather. And I just know that when God's word begins to go forth, it's not gonna come back empty. And I'm grateful for that kind of word. I'm, I'm glad that we're not just gathering together just to do it, but that the God of the universe has a word he wants to speak into our lives today. And when he begins to talk, Man, that's when, that's when things begin to shift and move. And I'm grateful for it. If you're, if you're here for the first time today, thank you for being here. I'm gonna talk just for a minute about some things going on uh, around the bridge just to make you aware of them. Of course, you can, you can find a lot of this stuff on our website, but I just wanted to make you aware of some of the highlights. Uh, and then we're gonna jump into the word here in just a minute. But if you're here for the very first time, uh, I'm Pastor Ryan. I'm so grateful that you're here today. And we have a connect card on the seat back in front of you. If you're watching online for the first time, there's a, a link you can click to get to a connect card. And we just wanna know you're here. We wanna just be able to put a face with a name. And, uh, and if, if you wanna talk to one of our staff members afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. There's a VIP desk on the way out uh, in the lobby. You can drop that connect card there. And they just wanna take a second or two with you. Uh, before you leave today, maybe put a gift in your hand, just our way of saying thank you for being here. Uh, we have a gift digitally online. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say it's not as cool as the one we have here, but if you're watching online, we wanna make sure that you don't feel left out either. So let us know you're here for the first time online too. Uh, and that Connect card is really for anybody who's here. So whether you're online or here in the house, let us know what your next step is. That's the Connect card is a way to do that. It does exactly what it says, connect because we don't just want you to attend services, we want you to be a part of the body of Christ. And so sometimes that means taking a next step and we wanna help you figure out what that is. Uh, a, a great next step, I'm skipping a little bit, but a great next step is baptisms. And that's coming up on March 26th. Uh, we already have several people signed up for that. Uh, and if, if, you're, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you haven't been baptized, hey, that's your next step. I heard somebody say, uh, one time they said, well, I'm not quite ready to do that yet. I'm not far enough along in my walk with God. You know, God's way more interested in where you're going than where you've been. And when we talk about what the Bible says about baptism, it's a starting place, not a destination you get to. In fact, baptism is nothing more than a public declaration on the outside of what's already happened in your heart. And what's happened in your heart when you accept Jesus is, I can't do it on my own. And that's what we're saying. It's a starting place. I love in Acts chapter two, when 3,000 people got saved, that was how the church first started. And 3,000 people got saved that day, and guess what? All 3,000 of them were baptized. That was a long church service. <laughs> I think the most we've ever done is nine around here. Uh, but if it's a starting place. So if, you've, if you're kind of fiddling around with the thoughts that you're not quite ready, you've given your life to Christ, but you're not quite ready, listen to me. The only prerequisite is that you say, God, you have control of my life and I, I'm gonna live for you, that's it. God will help you sort out the rest and we're here to help you do that as well. But if baptism is your next step, if you've given your life to him, register for that. Um, you can get that up to that on the events page at bridgechurch.cc. Um, one of the things I'm really grateful for is that we are relaunching uh, significantly our prayer team. We still have people that pray every single week, but one of the things that, uh, I've been missing around here a lot and um, is people praying for one another right here, a, an organized group of people that are praying around here at the altar and having people on site specifically to help you pray for certain needs. And we're always available to do that. But Pastor Danielle Suggs is gonna be leading our prayer ministry here. And there's really two parts to that. If you're interested in prayer, 
and you have a calling on your life to intercede for people. I think we're all called to pray, but there are certain people that have a passion and an unction in and of themselves. It's a godly thing to intercede for other people. And so we want those kinds of people to, to come today, right here at the front of this room. Uh, and we're gonna answer a couple questions that you have, maybe get some information from you and kind of set up a later date to meet and talk. Um, so not gonna be long, but we'd love to get a chance to talk with you. If you're watching online and you can't be at that, you can always uh, get more information. Just let the chat host know. We'll make sure you get some information about that. Uh, and you can always send us an email, at info at bridgechurch.cc. Uh, one more thing, and I'm gonna get off of here, but it's something that I'm really excited about, and that is April 1st. Say April 1st. Can you believe that's just in a couple of weeks? Isn't that crazy? Easter is right around the corner, and because of that, April 1st, our Bridge kids are having a huge Easter event at Berkeley Park right here in Goldsboro. And so you can find out information about that online as well, but they're gonna have all kinds of fun. They're gonna have food trucks. And if you've got Bridge Kids, come and be a part of that. April 1st, it's gonna be at 10 a.m. and it's gonna go to, I think, 1 p.m. And if you wanna stay later than that, you're more than welcome to, uh, but we're probably gonna leave. Just get. I don't know if the bouncy houses will still be there, but you're more than welcome to come hang out and have a good time. It's gonna be a blast. I'm so grateful that you're here today. We're gonna keep uh, starting a new series today called Good Day, Bad Day. We're talking about how at Jesus's worst day, he was still giving us an example of how we need to handle our worst day. So I want you to take a look at this and then we're gonna jump into God's word. I think it's kind of pointless for me to ask you if you've ever had a bad day. Would you agree to that? So I'm not even going to ask you if you've ever had a bad day. We all would say we've had bad days but when things aren't going right. Uh, and actually, I was thinking about we all have different kinds of bad days. We have bad days where things seem to like just go a little bit bad. Then we have some times where we come home and we kick the dog and we have to apologize to people that we've talked to. And then we have days where it's just, it's a whole other level. But I, I was researching a little bit of this and I found some people that had some bad days. Hopefully you've never been through some of this, but I got some pictures of some people that had a bad day. Here's the first picture that I wanna show you of someone who had a bad day. Yeah, they tried to drive their car onto the beach and in the words of my boys at Duck Dynasty, he gone, like, there's no way you're gonna be able to get that out. Um, a fun day at the beach turned into dancing with the crabs. Here's the next picture I wanna show you. Hopefully you've never had this happen to you. Um, beard caught in machinery. Tie it up. <laughs> if you wanna have it, fine, but maybe don't get it so close. Everybody say bad day. Bad day. That's a bad day. Here's the next one. Everybody say hey to Megan. Megan, Megan had a bad day. Megan is fired. <laughs> Everybody say bad day. Next one. This is the one I debated showing you or not. Everybody say bad haircut. Yeah, for a white guy anyway. This is, a, this is a white man who went to a black barber. And if you didn't know, black people and white people's hair are a little bit different. White people have the little widow's peak and 
Y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy. It's not racist. Me and Pastor Terrell already talked about it. He said it was okay for me to show that. It's just different. Hair's different, culturally different. It's okay. Everybody say bad day day. for him. (laughs) All right, show the next one. This one is is kind of funny. You may not know what it is right out of the gate, but here's a priest who did a public uh, broadcast of his mass he was doing, and he didn't realize that he had the hat and sunglass filter on the whole time. And so I'm sure his parishioners thought he was trying to start a new rap album uh, with the guy from the previous picture, but I'm sure... (laughs) I'm sure. <laughs> I like the second picture. He looks like he's getting ready to break down like verse three. You know what I mean? All right, let's move on. Next picture. So, so this, this man or woman took a gnarly jump off of a ski and they just face planted. Like everything in, they might still be in there. I don't know. The, the, the footprints leading up to it looks like uh, animal prints. <laughs> but so it looks like a deer came up and said, how you doing? See ya. And then, and then just left. Everybody say bad day. Bad day. We all have things happen where maybe it's something like this that becomes a funny story later that you tell at Christmas time. You know what I mean? Um, but oftentimes when we have a quote unquote bad day, things happen to us that really involve other people. And these things that happen to us, sometimes it's, it's not just something that's funny. In fact, sometimes things happen to us that never become funny. And it involves other people in our lives, or maybe they hurt us in such a way where we, we can't seem to get through it. In fact, they're not funny at all. They hurt, and they, they change us from that moment forward. And in this series, we're going to be talking about not having a bad day because I got my beard ripped out by, you know, a sander. In this series, we're gonna be talking about arguably one of the worst days that Jesus ever had. And we're gonna be looking at how he handled his worst day. Some of the things that he said and some of the things that he set an example for us as he was hanging there on the cross because that's probably what you're thinking is that probably was Jesus's worst day is when he was crucified, when when he was on the cross. And what's interesting is, is that's what we would call Good Friday today. That's actually coming up in a few weeks. We're leading up to that with this series. But it was anything, uh, anything but good for him. It was good for us. But for him, physically, emotionally, all these kinds of things we watched Jesus walk through, it was anything but a good day. But being the great God that he is and being the sovereign God that he is, even while he was going through his worst day possible, he was still teaching us life lessons. He was still operating in a mode of, I want to be an example to people that are watching me, specifically to the people, by the way, the word says that he knew you before you were in the womb. And he knitted you together. He crafted you together. And every day was written in your book before you were one day old. And so while he was there having his worst day, he was thinking about you and me. And he was setting an example of how we're supposed to handle our our bad day, our worst day. So I, I wanna jump in and we're gonna talk about his worst day. Some of you probably, most of you remember the day as we read in the Bible. It was actually a 24 or so period of time between Thursday and Friday, and he was having a bad day. He had the last supper with his disciples. He was thinking about what was gonna happen to him. He was in agony. Later on, we read in the scriptures where he was praying and he was, he was in such agony, he was sweating drops of blood. Duke did a, a study years ago that said under extreme stress and anxiety, you can actually burst capillary glands in your forehead and blood mixed with sweat can come out. And so they, they proved that this was true. And so he was under such stress. Uh, Later that night, he was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was arrested. He went through illegal trials all night long, Um, was slapped, was mocked, spit on, and then eventually beaten. And he was tortured by the Romans. And the Romans were were perfect executioners. They were torture masters. They, They knew how to torture you and at the same time keep you alive so you wouldn't bleed out. Uh, In fact, when you do the study, you you find that Jesus was pierced with what we would call today railroad spikes almost. They were huge spikes that would have gone into his wrist and they knew how to miss big arteries so that he would just hang there and not bleed out. 
And most people didn't die because of bleeding out when they were hanging on crosses. Romans knew how to do it in such a way that you sometimes they live for days. Uh, and so w- when, when you would die on a cross like that, you wouldn't die from bleeding out. You'd die from suffocation because you would be hung like this with your nails, uh, the, the spikes in your wrists and in your feet, and you would hang there and your lungs would kind of collapse and you can't breathe. And then you would try to find the strength to push up on your feet and then the excruciating pain from doing that with the spike in your feet just so you can get up above and get a breath and then back down. And that, that process would go on for hours and hours and days sometimes until eventually you would die of suffocation. And this is what Jesus was going through. Of course, he didn't die of suffocation. He gave his spirit up. But the Bible says that he was, was hoisted up. And I can just imagine hanging there and that coming up vertically and that vertical beam slamming into the ground. And that's when we hear Jesus' first words from the cross. Now, that's a bad day. And before we go any further, you might be thinking after hearing that, I've changed my mind. I've never had a bad, bad day. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm not worthy to say I've had a bad day because my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ went through that. I'll just kind of endure. So I've never had a bad day. And then we can kind of just ignore it, saying I'm not worthy enough to come to you, God, and say I'm having a a bad day. Not after watching what you went through. But before we go any further, I want to debunk the myth that because he went through so much, we're not allowed to give ourselves permission to say we're having a bad day or that we have hurts that are rocking our world. This is what Hebrews 4 and 15 says. For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize, say empathize, with our weaknesses, say our weaknesses, because we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. That means he's the Godhead, the part of the Godhead that looks at you and says, I get it. I understand what they're going through. And I just got to say, this verse would not exist if Jesus didn't want us to know that he gets where you are and he empathizes over your hurts and over your pains. And even if we didn't get nailed to a cross, he knows that your bad days are bad. And since they're important to you, they're important to him. Somebody say amen for a God that is, is relevant and understands where you are. So he understands that you have bad days. He understands that you've been hurt. Let's keep going. Here's the first thing he said from the cross that that we can learn from when we're having a bad day. In Luke 23, 34, this is what Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Can we say that again? Can we read that together? I just wanna read it again and I want you to say it with me. This is the first thing he said. One, two, three. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And it's amazing to me that he didn't just say this when they were doing all this to him. But what's interesting is it was the first thing he said. He prioritized it. This is the very first thing. And it's the first thing that we hear from Jesus when he's having the worst day of his life. And he shows us how to turn our worst times into something good. And it was about forgiveness. Forgiveness. You know, many times our quote unquote bad day involves somebody else that did something to us. And we just can't seem to get through it. It's the thing that we always go back to in our minds. And we start thinking about it. And man, it hurts. And we try to move on. But it's just, it keeps coming back. And for some of you, you've had such a a horrific thing happen that without even realizing it, you're actually sort of keeping time by it. Meaning when somebody says, well, how long have you been here at this job? Your, Your brain automatically goes to that staple in time when that person did that. Maybe it was a divorce. You think, okay, well, it's 2023 now. 2015 was the divorce. Okay, it's been this many years. And so, or or maybe someone hurt you in a different kind of way or somebody betrayed you or something happened that just shifted, you know, your world around. And so now you're actually keeping time by it and you, you don't even realize it. Maybe a parent growing up constantly criticized you. And you can never could do anything right. You just struggled with trying to be validated in the eyes of mom or the eyes of dad or maybe grandpa or grandma, somebody that raised you. Maybe it was somebody at work that just sabotaged something in you. Maybe you were up for a promotion and they just sort of, sort of came and pulled it out from under you. Maybe said something that wasn't even true. And now all of a sudden you're having to fight uh, people saying things about you and people, you know, uh, and it's not even true. And at work, it's, you're looked at way different. And you're like, man, I, I don't deserve that. And this, they're harboring the feelings of unforgiveness. Maybe you had somebody close to you just completely stab you in the back. They weren't supposed to do that. They were supposed to be close to me. They were supposed to love me. Maybe your spouse had an affair. 
That's one of the most difficult things to come back from, although it is possible. But so much grace, so much forgiveness is required. Maybe you were abused physically or emotionally and you don't know how to come back from that. Somebody that was close to you. Jesus is telling us the very first thing you need to do on your bad day is the very first thing that he did. Forgive. Forgive. See, your willingness to forgive is primarily for you, not for them. That's why he's so adamant about it. That's why it's the first thing that he did as an example of what we're supposed to do because our willingness to forgive isn't about the other person. It's primarily for us because as long as you're holding on to hurt with your hand, then you don't have a hand to hold on to God's hand. As long as we're sort of holding on to the pain and sort of rehearsing it in our minds and speaking badly about somebody or, or just, ah, well, that's just impossible to do. I can't, can't forgive that. But we're holding on to the hurt. Therefore, we can't hold on to God's hand. And here's the kicker. Therefore, we can never really fulfill the God-given potential that he has in our lives. And your God-given potential has everything to do with his will for you. That's where you're gonna find the most joy. His will for you is gonna be the vein and the path where you find the most peace. It's where you're gonna connect with God in the, in the most powerful ways. It's where you're gonna feel heaven hit earth in your spirit whenever you're so close to the Lord. And when you're holding on to hurt, you can't hold on to God's hand. Therefore, you can't fulfill your God-given purpose. That's why Proverbs 18, 19 says that an offended person is more unyielding than a fortified city, meaning you're not gonna budge. An offended person that keeps offense and that is unwilling to forgive, you live with an offended heart. He says, you will not yield to anything, just like a fortified city. You're not gonna yield to anything other than callousness and hardness towards somebody that did something to you. And I know some people are going, well, I don't wish them bad. I don't, I won't wish, well, whatever. But you're still harboring it. And you're holding on to that hurt. Therefore, you can't hold on to God. And when that kind of stuff happens, you're gonna find yourself protecting the places of hurt in you, not healing from it. And holding on to God's hand, that's always gonna be a place of healing. That's always gonna be a road where he walks you through and you can't heal and hold on to hurt at the same time. And so Jesus, he said, forgive, forgive him. Very first thing he said, right in the middle of it. And you know what? If, if he had simply tried to endure the cross, well, I'll just let me see if I can tough this out. Those jerks, you know? If he had just simply tried to endure it and not forgive them, he would be, I just gotta, this isn't a scripture, I haven't maybe seen it yet, but I, I think he would have, have at least been tempted more so than he was to be rescued by the armies of heaven. I don't deserve this. And he had the power to do it. This was a guy that spoke and dead things came to life. He had God's power on the inside of him, but he wanted God's will more than he wanted that but can you, if he had have given into that, just endured and not forgiven, he'd have never fulfilled his God-given purpose to stay there and save the world from their sins. That was his God-given purpose. That was the potential that God put in him. What made the difference? He forgave, first thing. That's what enabled him to do it. So forgiveness, listen, forgiveness was the pathway for Jesus to fulfill his God-given potential. I want you to capture that for a minute and think about it. He had a God-given potential to fulfill too. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. And forgiveness was part of that. And he knew it. And he was somebody that, that exercised that forgiveness all throughout his life. Look at what he said in Luke 17, three uh, and four. He says, if your brother repents, forgive him. I love how he goes on. If he sins against you even seven times in a day, wow, seven times in one day, what's your limit? He says, but he comes to you saying, I repent, then you forgive him. And somebody says, well, that man, Jesus just loves them so much. We're just supposed to be religious and forgive and blah, da, 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 da. No, he was saying forgiveness is for you, not for them. That's why he wants you to be a habitual forgiver. He wasn't giving you some religious rule to follow. He was giving you a God hack that he experienced because he was following God himself. He said, you want to be free? You, you want to follow in line to this God-given potential that you have? He said, watch me do it. Forgive. I've learned how to do that, even so much so that when he was on the cross, the very first thing he says is, is forgive him. See, and what we begin to realize this is that forgiveness is the pathway to fulfilling your God-given potential too. It was for Jesus and it is for you. And it's not easy to connect that. 
my God-given potential and forget. Can't God just do what he wants to do in my life without me having to deal with what that other person did to me? That wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. Why does God want me to walk through the hurt and the pain? Can't he just sort of, as I just follow him, just sort of magically do something and allow me to just keep going and walk in his will for my life? Listen, you're always gonna have offenses come up. You wanna know why? Because we're not perfect. This is a not so perfect world. It's not heaven. And so because of that, somebody is going to hurt you. I tell married couples that come in for counseling and especially pre-marriage counseling, I, I have the wife look at the husband. I'm like, look, he's not a perfect guy. He's, he's gonna hurt you. And then she says, yeah, he is, amen. Now look at him and I'm like, look, you see her? As beautiful as she is, she's not perfect. And she's probably at some point gonna hurt you. And he knows better than to say what she said. <laughs> he just sits there. We're gonna hurt each other, man. And it's not that we want to. It's not that we're horrible people. We just got this thing called a sin nature. And sometimes we let it get a little bit too close and we hurt. In fact, Jesus said in Luke 17, one, it's impossible that no offenses should come. And so we, what we really wanna do is just say, God, I just, I wanna live my life and just not go through any of that. I just, I don't wanna deal with forgiveness. But he's saying, hey, it's impossible that no offenses should come. If you really wanna get in line with what I wanna do in your life, you got to deal with forgiveness because it's gonna happen. It's gonna come into your life. And God knows that it can be a barrier between you and what he wants to do in you. So that's why Jesus says, forgive, forgive, forgive. It's not words you say, it's, a, it's an attitude of who you're becoming, understanding that he forgave me when I was at my worst and needed forgiveness. Therefore, I have to look at other people and with a power and a grace that only God can give, I have to be willing to forgive too. So what does God do? He calls us to release the hurt and the pain of everybody that's done something against us. Just like he called Jesus to. He called Jesus to do the same thing. Forgive everyone who's ever tried to ruin your life. Maybe someone's trying to ruin your life now and you know who they are. Like you, thoughts come into your head right now. This person is just actively trying to ruin my life. You know, if they just won't let up. I heard somebody say one time that there's not enough appropriate words I can say as a Christian that meet the demands of what someone is putting me through right now. You ever been there? Tim Hawkins has some Christian cuss words you can say, like dag nabbit. One of the best ones I ever heard was from Tammy Forrester. She messes up and she goes, fudge pops. I love that, fudge pops. Y'all were looking at me because that sounded really close to something else and you're wondering what I'm gonna say next. Skin a rinky dinky do. I mean, you can just go on with it. Shish kebab. That was close, wasn't it? All kinds of things you can say. But the, the thing about it is we got to get to a place where we're, I don't know what that was all about. Wasn't in my notes. But we, we've got to get to a place where we're forgiving people. And let me just ask you, what's holding you back from forgiveness? What is holding you back from fulfilling your God-given potential? Because that's really what... I'm asking you. You know, Jesus went through several things during this process of his bad day. And, and you've probably been through at least one of them, maybe all of them. But I wanna talk through these things. And I, I just want you to, to, to sort of contemplate what is keeping me from forgiving? Let's look, at, let's, let's look at what Jesus went through. One, he went through betrayal. These aren't on the screen, but I want you to hear them. I want you to write them down. He went through betrayal. You know, Judas, one of his disciples the one that, one of the 12, you know, he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And then when he walked up and identified him in the garden that night with the crowd, the mob that was coming to arrest him, this is how he uh, identified that this was the one. He walked up to him and kissed Jesus on the cheek. And that was a greeting in that time and in that culture. And basically greeted Jesus with a kiss and betrayed him. I mean, he, he was supposed to be loved. He was supposed to love. Have you experienced that? somebody that was supposed to be close to you, someone that wasn't supposed to do that, but yet stabbed you in the back, deeply letting you down. He was betrayed. He was also falsely accused. Man, if there is something that can cause unforgiveness in our hearts and, and be tempted to stay there, it's being accused of something that you didn't do or somebody painting a picture about you that you didn't have anything to do with. 
And now everybody else, when they talk to them, their first impression of you is this falsehood, this, this sort of, uh, this umbrella that come, about what you're supposed to be. They'll take one small thing maybe about you and they'll turn it into everything that you are. Maybe they said something bad about you and it wasn't true. I, if you're like me, I don't mind being accused of something if I actually did it. <laughs> but it's when I didn't do it. I had a friend of mine, uh, he's been a friend of mine for, for gosh, 20 years. He, this is before he got saved, years and years ago, somebody falsely accused him of a crime. And he was probably associated with the people, but he didn't commit the crime and ended up having to go three years in prison. He was so angry and so mad at this person that saved his own neck and blamed my friend for what the other person did. Three years in prison. And while he was in prison, again, he wasn't a Christian at this time, he vowed that he was gonna, when he got out, he was gonna take that man's life. He was gonna kill him. That's how, that's how angry he was. And through the grace of God, through a prison ministry, uh, God was able to reach him and he gave his heart and life to Jesus he, he started dealing with the, the thoughts of forgiveness and dealing with the first stages of how to go about that. But he really just kind of went on about his life and got out of prison and he uh, got married. He had a child. He started back in church. This is when he became a friend of mine. Great guy, humble guy. And anyway, he was in Lowe's Hardware one day, he, all these years later after the incident. And all of a sudden he sees coming down the aisle that guy. That's the guy that did it. And he said instinctively, he said, Ryan, I don't even know what hit me, but I grabbed a pipe just instinctively and I was gonna go over there and hit him in the head with it. And it was at that moment that the Holy Spirit looked at me and said, you've got some things that you still haven't given to me. There's some unforgiveness still in your heart. And it scared him so bad. And he put the pipe down and, and he said, Ryan, how, how do I get through this? How do I do it? But he was falsely accused. Maybe you've been falsely accused and you're still holding on to the hurt because it's still circulating, something's still going on. And there's still something inside of you, the Holy Spirit saying, you still need to give that to me. Jesus was falsely accused. He was also rejected. The disciples scattered whenever he was arrested. The very ones, if anybody was qualified to come and defend Jesus's honor over these false accusations, they scattered. And Peter one of the closest to Jesus, he followed, but he followed at a distance, scared. And the very first time someone recognized him and said, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Hey, weren't you one of his disciples? He denied even knowing him, rejected by the people that were supposed to love him the most. Rejection is such a big thing in our society, especially among young people that judge everything about acceptance in their lives on how good their social media post is going or how it compares to what other people are doing. And it's, it's so bad and it's so unhealthy to be able to look at somebody else's opinion of me and measure my whole self-worth based on that. It's almost as if today's culture is you start at the baseline of being rejected and you have to build your self-worth. But I start rejected. How important is it for parents and grandparents to pour into their kids and grandkids? You're not accepted because of what happens on social media or because of someone's opinion of you. You're accepted and valued because there's a God who came to this earth and died for your soul. You're so worthy of it. To speak into their lives and let the baseline be, no, you're, you're accepted and you're loved. But Jesus, he was even rejected. Have you been through rejection? Have you had, do you have feelings of rejection? When you put a picture of you without a filter and then somebody else puts a picture with the filter and then they get more likes than what you got? Well, I wasn't using a filter, so this is what I really look like. It's, it's, it's just feelings of, of being rejected and man, or, or how about this? I don't know why I'm vamping on this, but it's so, so true. You, you, you do a post and it's like, it gets like, I don't know, a hundred likes. That happens every time I post a picture of my kids. I don't know why, but this is, and then you post a picture like two days later and it's not of what you posted before and it gets like three. <laughs> and you're like, well, three people liked it. Well, why didn't more people like it? People liked the last one. Why didn't they like this one? And you're never gonna say that because that just makes you sound menial and dumb. But inside they were feeling, well, maybe people don't like me. And it's Facebook. It's the highlight reel. It's, it has nothing to do with your value, nothing, abs say nothing, please. Nothing. Just absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I was like, absolutely three of you. Absolutely nothing. 
absolutely nothing to do with your value. Absolutely nothing to do with, with whether you're rejected or not. I serve a God who says you're the head and not the tail. You're, you're above and not beneath. I, I, I didn't come to this earth so that you could feel rejected. I came that you could be lifted high and that you could be a co-heir with Jesus Christ. You're accepted. But Jesus was rejected. And not only that, but about nine o'clock in the morning, he goes through the brutality of beatings and the crucifixion. He was abused. Maybe you've been abused physically. Maybe you've been abused sexually. And it's not okay and it's not fair and it never should have happened. But I want you to know Jesus was abused too very physically. In fact, he was abused so badly that the prophet Isaiah, and it came to pass in Isaiah 52, said that he was beaten beyond recognition. He was beaten so badly that by the time they got through with him, he didn't even resemble a human. He, he, he was beaten. And if that wasn't bad enough, there's the mockery. There was the spitting in his face. And on top of all of it, the Romans hung him naked on the cross. Now, you've never seen a picture of Jesus naked. You've never seen a picture of, uh, of anything like that. You've never seen a movie where Jesus was depicted as naked. Well, that's because they're not gonna show you that. You just see him with a loincloth, but he was hung there naked, humiliated for three hours, hanging there. Not only all the other stuff I just mentioned, but now everybody's seeing him as, as a human being. He went through all that, not just so you wouldn't have to go through it, but he went through all that so that the Bible could show us how to handle our worst of times. And the very first thing that Jesus says while hanging there naked, having been through all that, is forgive them. Forgive. They don't know what they're doing. He said, well, that was Jesus. That's not me. Look at Hebrews 12, verse two and three. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both, he, he started and finished this race we're already in. Study how he did it. And that's really what we're doing for this series. We're studying how he did it. But because he never lost sight of where he was headed, he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, the shame, whatever. Because he had a, a mindset of reconciliation on the other side of forgiveness, on the other side of what he was currently going through. He had a mindset of, of something that was broken being restored back together. That was a relationship with you and a relationship with me. And God was saying on the other side of this, Jesus, hang on. He had to believe it in faith, knowing that, hey, I'm, I'm gonna fulfill my purpose that you sent me for. But it started with forgiveness. And I want you to understand what they're saying here. Jesus said that, or the writer of Hebrews said that because he looked on the other side of what he was currently in, he was able to endure. And you may say, I'm not able to endure what somebody did to me. I'm not able to endure this whole forgiveness thing that you're talking about. Listen, if you'll keep your eyes, well, he said, study how he did it. Keep your eyes on him. I'm telling you, if you will keep your eyes on, the, on the, the faith that God puts in your heart to believe that there is a restoration on the other side of this, then you'll have the faith and the strength to endure forgiveness. Because I'm not talking about somebody, you know, cut you off in traffic. The kind of bad day I'm talking about is if somebody hurt you so badly that you keep coming back to it even though they're not even thinking about it anymore. You wanna get through that? It's not gonna be a quick prayer and how do you do. It's gonna be, I've gotta keep my mind continually focused, just like Jesus did, on the other side of forgiveness to be able to have the strength and the faith to believe that God is going to come through for me, that there is freedom on the other side of this, that I don't have to be a slave to it anymore. I may not feel it now, but there is something on the other side. The Bible says when Jesus did that, he could put up with the cross, he could put up with the shame, whatever it took. For the joy set before him, he endured. And then 1 Peter 4, 1 reminds us, hey, strengthen yourselves with that same way of thinking. Strengthen yourself with that same way of thinking that Christ had. Now, I know that forgiving is difficult because I've said all that and we're probably going like, well, man, I, I don't know how I'm gonna do that. Let me just take a second and talk about what forgiveness is not because I think the, the main reasons we can't forgive is because we think forgiveness is a whole list of things that's really not. Let me tell you what, 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 I, what they are. Forgiveness is not excusing. Jesus never excused what the people did to him. He didn't condone it like it was okay. Forgiveness isn't excusing or accepting what somebody else did to you. Forgiveness is simply taking your hand off their throat. 
I'm choosing not to hold that against you any longer. You're never going to agree with what they did, and that's okay. God doesn't expect you to agree with it because he doesn't agree with it either. But just like Jesus no longer holds his hand on our throats, he no longer holds our sin against us, that means we forgive others and we don't hold it against them either. So understand, forgiveness is not condoning what somebody else did. You never have to bear the weight of agreeing with somebody. Forgiveness is also not reconciliation. I think sometimes we get caught in a trap where we think, well, if I don't reconcile the relationship, I must not have forgiven. Look, forgiveness might lead to reconciliation, but it's not reconciliation in and of itself. In fact, the person that you need to forgive to free yourself and get yourself back on this God path that he has for you, they may not even be alive anymore but you're still holding on to it because of what somebody did so long ago. Or it could be that it's just impossible to reconcile because of their choice. But that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to forgive. God still says, forgive. It may not mean reconciliation. You need to forgive. Let me say another one. Forgiveness is not about what's fair. Well, they don't deserve to be forgiven. Listen, for some of you, I get it. You don't deserve to be in the position you're in. Somebody did something to you, it's not fair. You've been hurt without cause. And it's not fair, you have to hurt. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there now. Somebody else did it, so why should I have to walk through the hurt and the pain and the, and the struggle of trying to figure out how to, how to forgive? Lord, just do it in me, do whatever you want, but I just can't go through it. It's not fair for me to have to bear the weight of this and yet them walk around and it just seems like everything's going good for them. It's not fair that I gotta figure out how to forgive. It's not fair. Well, let me tell you, forgiveness isn't fair. It's never fair. In fact, it wasn't fair for Jesus to forgive. But here's the kicker, it's worth it to forgive because you find yourself becoming free from slavery of the burden and the weight that unforgiveness puts on your heart. You find yourself becoming free in the sense that now because I've forgiven them, I understand fully what Christ did in me and now I'm able to turn around and forgive other people because offenses are always gonna come. It's not just something I did once, it becomes a part of who I am. Forgiveness is never fair but it's worth it. It's worth it for you. And God backs that up. He backs up forgiveness. And because he backs up forgiveness, here's what the last one. Forgiveness is not impossible. For some of you, you may be thinking, man, there's no way I can forgive. I wish I could. I know people right now, I've talked to them and, and they go, I'll, I'll never be able to forgive them for what they did. And what the person did, man, I'm like, man, I don't know how either. In my heart, in my head, I'm not saying it to them, but I'm thinking, I, I get it. I get the temptation to just sit in this and not forgive because man, that's, and I could, I could fill in your blank and give you a, a, a scenario and you're like, yeah, I don't know. Don't know. In this very room, if you're watching online and in whatever living room you're in, I'm not naive enough to think that we're all just sitting here without things that are very difficult to walk through and forgive. And for some of you, you're thinking, man, it's impossible for me to do it. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that God backs up forgiveness. Therefore, forgiveness is not impossible. Let me encourage you. That's what forgiveness is not, but this is what it is. Forgiveness is the pathway to fulfilling your God-given potential. Do you feel stuck? You feel like no matter how much I try to get ahead in my spirit and in my heart and my connection with God, there's always that thing that person did and I just can't seem to get healing, can't seem to move forward, can't seem to get over it. Listen, it's not about what God isn't doing. It's about you releasing in your heart the permission to hold on to it, to, to let go of the hurt and not even know how it's gonna happen, but just fall on your face before God and that same hand that was holding onto the hurt as you begin to let go, grab onto God's hand and say, God, I don't know where this is going, but I trust you to lead me there. Work in my heart however I, you need to work. If it causes tears, let cry the tears. If it causes anxiety, then throw the anxiety onto God and have anxiety and fear in his presence. Don't do it by yourself. The Bible says don't conform to the pattern of the world. But, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're able to test and approve what his will is. Stay in his presence if you have all the feeling. He can handle the feelings. Throw it in his lap. Lord, I just refuse to hold on to the hurt anymore. I, I'm holding on to your hand. You'll have all the feels doing that. 
But what he promises is that he will guide you and put you back on the path of fulfilling your God-given purpose. And that's where you're gonna find peace. That's where you're gonna find freedom. That's where you're gonna find blessing. That's where you're gonna find the, the path that moves you forward. And you look back and that thing that they did, it no longer becomes all the feelings every time I think about it. Now it just becomes something that happened in my life. It becomes part of my story. It becomes a testimony of how God has delivered me, not because of what they did, but because of the forgiveness the impossible forgiveness. It used to be impossible because of what they did. But now look, now I'm free. And now you can turn around and help other people walk through the same thing. It's not impossible. It's, it's, it's getting you back on the path to fulfilling your God-given purpose. And that doesn't seem like the road. Man, forgiving, that, that doesn't seem like the road to get you back on the path. But this is what I can tell you. Two things very fast. Begin praying for that person that hurt you. Now, I know you just cringed some kind of good when I said that. Sometimes you don't have the words. You don't even want to. In fact, you wish God would do a couple of other things to them. But when you begin praying for them, sometimes you don't have anything to say other than, Lord, do in their life what you want to do. I trust you with figuring that out. But I'm just lifting them up to you in prayer. Do in their life what you want to do. Sometimes that's all the prayer you got. It's a five second prayer, but it's a heart set that begins to shift and move inside of you. And it aids forgiveness. The other thing that you need to do when you're learning how to forgive is commit yourself to never say a bad word about them. And you're like, well, that box has already been not checked. <laughs> commit yourself today from this point forward. I'm not gonna gossip. I'm not gonna portray them as something. I'm not going to rehearse in my mind and with my words what somebody did because that doesn't lead to forgiveness putting me back on the path that fulfills my God-given purpose. That actually takes me the other way. And as I begin to speak out cursings, you might not say, well, I'm cursing them. When you begin to speak bad about them and it's fueled by a heart of unforgiveness, what you're doing is you're letting go of God's hand and you're putting that hand back on that hurt. You want to you wanna walk in forgiveness? Let go. Begin to pray, God bless them in the only way you know how and commit yourself to never say a bad word about them. See, forgiveness is what makes us more like Jesus than anything else. Because when anybody had a right not to forgive, it was him. But the very first thing he did was an example. And he said, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing, forgive them. When he was at his worst, he forgave. And we can't get away from offenses. We can't get away from people hurting us. Even the people closest to us are gonna hurt us. Jesus said they're sure to come. The only question is, what are we gonna do with them when they come? And I just wanna pose the question to you as I close, what are you gonna do with the offenses that you've been holding on to? And God offers right now, let go of the hurt and grab my hand. You don't have to know the end. Just grab my hand, hold on. And I'll lead you there. Let me say a prayer for you before we go. God, I know because your word says it, that we've all walked through a fence and we've all been tempted to hold on to unforgiveness. And I know, I just, not because I know names or stories, but I just know in a room this size and when you consider who's watching online, I'm not naive enough to think that there are people that are holding on and struggling with unforgiveness right now. Man, but I love your word when it says you get it. We're not just saying, Lord, help me as if somehow you don't understand. You're looking at us going, I understand where you are. And that's what makes you such a worthy God to come to and to say, help me, please. And so my prayer, Lord, is for the power of the Holy Spirit to go into hearts right now and begin to crush thoughts that say forgiveness isn't possible or I, I, I'm not gonna be able to, to crush thoughts that say I wanna go out and speak bad of them. I need, to, I need to rectify myself. I need to fix the situation. And I pray that we would just reconcile ourselves to hold your hand, to hear your voice, to begin praying for that person and commit ourselves to not speak another bad word about them. And in that process, Lord, begin to, to challenge and change our hearts to not just hear about forgiveness, to not just know about forgiveness, but to experience it for ourselves. I pray that blessing in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching today. If you haven't already, take some time to fill out the online connect card. We'd love to know that you were here. I hope today's message touched you in a special way. Again, we thank you for watching today. See, See you, you next week. week.